a very good afternoon to all. At the outset, I would like to thank the scientific organizing committee and especially Dr. Mayuri Khamar ma'am for giving me this opportunity and making me a part of this IC. So today we are going to deal and talk about that how do we evaluate the angle with gonioscopy. The angle structures, the landmarks is commonly well known. But actually this gonioscopy, which is known to be a reference gold standard for angle evaluation, does it has any limitations? Let's see that actually what is the situation. So glaucoma, commonly known as the silent thief of sight, which is the most common cause of preventable blindness, but that's an irreversible blindness, has got the concept and definitions and classifications changing and evolving over a period of time. So only if we timely know that where we are standing with our patient, definitely a timely intervention can help us to prevent this permanent blinding condition. Looking at the uh, projected uh, global prevalence of uh, glaucoma burden through 2040 by this meta-analysis done by Cheng et al, which said that it's a huge increase, especially when we talk about the Asian countries where we reside. There's a huge increase from 46.24 to 66.83 million people going to suffer as an estimate burden of glaucoma. So again, talking about the Indian scenario, as we all know that Angle closure is a more blinding condition and it has got, I, sh I can say, a faster progression as compared to the open angle glaucoma when it is uncontrolled. So by these several studies done in our own country, we can see that the blindness is caused by more of the angle closure state. And the minute we talk about angle closure state, it comes something about the angle closure. So before we proceed, let's see that actually what is angle closure. Basically, it is a disease of overlap maybe overlap at the level of pupillary block, could be a plateau iris, could be the position of the lens or could be a thick iris or a hump. So to simplify this, we can understand simply that the block could be at the level of iris or the pupil, could be at the level of ciliary body or could be at the level of lens, that is lens-induced glaucoma. Retrolenticular portion could be causing malignant glaucoma. So these all are the uh, um, uh, portions where the angle closure can take place. Only if we are able to define each and everything, each and every structure is, uh, we are able to identify basically the pathophysiology that it, uh, because in glaucoma only one funda works, that you know the pathology, you treat the disease. Only controlling the pressure is not going to help us. So we need to be very clear and precise about the diagnosis because as we know that the, uh, even with this study done by Thomas et al, that even if we, we have done the uh, PIs in the cases of primary angle closure, they tend to uh, progress to PACG also. So that means a timely intervention and evaluation, even after you have done and performed a PI for your case, is really required. So the role of the gonioscopy is basically the correct and precise diagnosis of the disease, along with the dynamic indentation gonioscopy, which is referred to the current reference standard for assessing the angle structures and their configuration. I'm not going to go in the details of the angle structures because uh, we all know that. Let's see some common case scenarios where gonioscopy can help us and where the newer modalities which are coming into picture gradually, how they are going to help us and aid to the further diagnosis of our patients. Let's talk about this particular case where uh, the patient presented to us with a closed angle and on performing a PI, the angles were opening in, uh, with difficulty on compression or they were not opening at all. So actually the story started here. Though this picture is not the uh, corresponding picture of the previous gonioscopy, uh, the same patient, but yes, this was the clinical scenario, which is little difficult for a beginner to identify because this is the structure where a person should be uh, uh, highlighting while doing a, a gonioscopy. But that's very easy to uh, just uh, uh, overlook that particular changes because this is the double hump pattern your scenario is going to be a patent PI, IOPs is still on the higher side or angles are not opening. So that means that's why it's always said that after performing a peripheral iridotomy for your cases, please go ahead and do a repeat gonioscopy. And then you see, and when uh, suppose you have missed this diagnosis, so this can be further 
confirmed by this particular modality, that's UBM, which shows you the anteriorly placed ciliary body with obliterated ciliary sulcus. So in case, if you miss it via gonioscopy, that's a reference gold standard, that too we are talking about the beginners, the first year residents, then probably you can just take a help of this added advantage of this particular diagnostic modality. And the minute you uh, label anybody as having a plateau iris configuration, try to differentiate it with the pseudo plateau iris. That's something behind the iris or the cilia body. And here is the, uh, I should uh, say that there is emphasis is needed because the management strategy changes for both the conditions. Why I am talking so much about plateau iris? We all know that angle closure, most common cause of blindness. Angle closure, progression at a faster rate if the disease is not getting controlled. But what is this plateau iris? Because we know that angle closure is a disease of a growing age. And if you see a young individual with angle closure, that should raise your doubt or suspicion that the individual is going to have a plateau iris. Let's see through several studies done in our country, uh, that is uh, a first study done by CS, uh, GC et al, who said that the anteriorly directed ciliary process were seen both in eyes with plateau iris and as well as the eyes in PACG, despite the fact that they were having a deep anterior chamber, even after anterior, uh, sorry, iridotomy. So it's not that, that you, the, um, this thing, uh, anterior chamber is shallow or the anterior chamber has deepened after performing iridotomy and the job gets over. No, actually the job starts, uh, it initiates from there only. Now this is a plateau iris. Again, I'm talking about the neo-diagnostic tool uh, because I have been assigned to talk about the limitations of gonioscopy. So when we know that all of us must have come across a child or a kid performing a gonioscopy and we know that it's a Herculean task. So again, this neo-diagnostic modality, that's UBM, help us to diagnose plateau iris in children also. So we can say in all with the help of this particular study that approximately 30% of the eyes with PACG have plateau iris. The component of plateau iris is always there. Now, again proceeding further, we have been talking about plateau iris, we've been talking about the PI. So normal, the procedure is we do the uh, PI, we see the, we evaluate the patient on a slit limb examination and we say, okay, the PI is open, but what if your pressures are still hiking and the, uh, this thing, uh, your pressures are hiking and still you think that your uh, PI is patent, but actually the PI ha have got a residual membrane as seen in this image, which is seen by an anterior segment OCT also. So again, gradually you can see that how the AS OCT and UBM is coming and sweeping his role in the diagnostic armamentarium of glaucoma. So let's see that angle closures, what do they have more to say? As seen by this study done by ZAP, uh, that's a ZAP trial, which says that the angle width, which is a very important determinant of the angle closure, especially the patients who are having, uh, they are prone for angle closure, they see that after laser PI, the common thinking is, okay, the angle is open, we have seen the disc, nothing is going to happen, but no. Actually, you have to just see on that patients and monitor that patient throughout his lifetime because this DAP trial says that the, angles, the angle width remained stable for six months but then decreased significantly by 18 months after a LPI. That means it is not only a question of 18 months, it's a lifelong tenure that you have to continue monitoring your patients. Along with gonioscopy and many other things which we have to talk about. That's the thing comes here, the role of the quantitative measurement of the angle. With the help of what? Obviously, it's not going to be gonioscopy. It's going to be certain other modalities like anterior segment OCT or UBM. Because whenever we talk about the angle width, or a angle closure or an eye which is more prone for an angle closure attack, a larger iris volume, smaller anterior cha uh, chamber volume, or a greater pupillary diameter. Everything is, it comes down to the same thing, reducing the angle width, thus making your patient more prone towards the angle closure attack. So only if you know that your patient is having these many risk factors uh, besides having an occludable angle or a uh, suspected angle, then only you can prevent your patient from further future attacks. Now, whenever we are talking about any new modality, we have to standardize it, titrate it with the uh, already occurring diagnostic modality. That is, uh, we can say that is a sort of agreement. So this agreement was done by Baskaran et al. through the, one of the studies which said that there was a moderate agreement between the SSOCT and angle, uh, this gonioscopy. 
Now, these are the several uh, uh, quantitative measurements which are anterior segment, OCT, or anything can give us. And here, the study done by Cheng et al., they even identified that uh, iris bowing that we think as a beginner, that might be a very small thing. What, what uh, the question comes, iris bowing hai, kuch nahi karna hai, but it's not like that. Even a parameter like iris bowing has a significant role to play when it comes to the angle width independent of the anterior chamber depth. So always we have to look for the additional risk factors in the form of iris curvature, volume, and area. So again, coming back to some of the clinical scenarios, you see a clinic uh, case in your clinic which is having a history of trauma and a persistently low IOP. So what do you think? That it could be a CD cleft. Uh, again, seen by a UBM. This is a case where would you like to see pupillary block along with posterior sinecare. You want to see that what is happening to the iris lens diaphragm, UBM comes to your rescue. This is a case where gonioscopy shows a pupillary, uh, there's an angle closure, but actually it's not a pupillary block, it's an angle closure with the serochoroidal diffu uh, effusion, which is the management is going to be helped by only steroids usage. Assessing the blep function, then the limitations the actually of gonioscopy is going to be pure documentation, learning curve, no measurements. And uh, when the study was done, there was perception that there is upgradation of gonioscopy which is required, even the residents, they gave the feedback. Community-based study says that there is a gradually phasing off of the use of the gonioscopy. So I would like to conclude my talk by leaving a point to pointer here, here that okay, we are okay with the newer modal modalities which are coming into picture, but yes, we need to redefine and reconsider the current definitions and methods used to diagnose and manage the primary angle closure disease. So all these newer modalities can be used as an adjunctive tool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shweta, for uh, such a nice talk. The question we will take in the end, take home the message that I would like to pass here is, though she has elaborated a lot on the plate 2 iris, how the imaging plays in the role, but the gonioscopy is a gold standard. All the patients should have a dynamic gonioscopy also that cannot be done with uh, anterior segment imaging. You can see the pigments, blood vessels pass using the gonioscopy. And it should be repeated if the patient has undergone any procedure or maybe yearly it should be the uh, no, occludable angle can be occluded after one year, two years. So yearly repetition of the gonioscopy. Anything you would like to add, Chandvin? Yeah, absolutely. I would uh, go with uh, Dr. Mayuri that gonioscopy remains the gold standard and it's gonioscopy, gonioscopy and gonioscopy. And as Shweta said, that uh, that's only an adjunctive tool if you're using the anterior segment OCT or the UVM for that matter. But mm -hmm. please don't forget to do a gonioscopy before you diagnose a glaucoma or before you write an anti-glaucoma drug. Please remember to do gonioscopy. Mm 